Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today we're going to be going over how to create a one-page marketing plan for your janitorial company. Um, and a lot of what we're going to cover is hopefully to uh, make make marketing a little less intimidating uh, and give you guys a plan for for all the moving parts of, of what your, your marketing should include. So before we get started, uh, a little bit of ba a background on myself. My name is Matt Cooper. I'm the COO here at SWEPT. Uh, and the last 15 years of my experience has really been focused on marketing and specifically in the digital marketing uh, arena. Um, I, I have certifications in Google Analytics, Google AdWords, and HubSpot, some of the tools we're going to be talking about today, as well as I've worked with, um, over the course of those that decade and a half, worked with a lot of companies uh, from B2C, business to consumer, B2B, business to business, as well as B2G, which is business to government. Um, so let's jump right in. So as I mentioned, the goal here for uh, for this session is really to give you an action plan uh, to improve your company's marketing. Uh, we're going to cover a ton of information. And uh, the analogy that I like to use a lot is um, there are a lot of moving parts to marketing. It's a little bit like an engine. Uh, and I'm going to be covering quite a bit of info. Uh, what I want you to do is not get too intimidated about all the different parts. You're not going to walk out of this session um, being a mechanic uh, by any means, but you are going to get familiar with all the different components, uh, where you're going to actually be able to put your time and make the most impact, and in what order should you be really thinking about your marketing uh, for your cleaning company. So at a high level, uh, this is really what a marketing plan should include. And so what we've done here is break in, broken your, your marketing plan into uh, the, the way that your relationship with your customer forms uh, before you actually have a relationship, um, then during, once you've gotten their attention, and after they become a customer. And we're really going to touch on three actual uh, phases of each one of those different phases in the relationship um, that we're going to cover. Um, and so let's jump right into the first one. And we're going to talk about uh, the information that you're going to need to tackle, the, the tasks that you're going to need to tackle when thinking about uh, the relationship before you actually get their attention. So the first topic here that I want to talk about is defining your target audience. So the goal of this phase really is to attract a prospect to your business. Um, a prospect, by definition, is someone who is, who's got the potential or is likely to become a customer. So to talk about that more specifically, let's dive into what I think one of the first challenges that many companies like yourselves probably run into. And that is really when you think about who it is you can sell your service to, most start from a marketing perspective uh, at the level of anyone that could could actually purchase a cleaning service. And this is most times where a lot of people take that first misstep. Uh, the reason is that for everyone to buy your product, um, your relevancy to that audience is, is extremely low. It's unlikely to be super relevant. So the first thing we want to do is start thinking about how you can move from all people that you could sell your product to, to just a few people that you know for sure if you got the opportunity to do well and deliver that service, that there would be no question about the quality and there need be no question about why your experience is above and beyond anyone else that you could be competing with. So that may be, you know, picking just a few of these target niches that you would want to go after. So before we were a software company, we started out as an actual cleaning company. And we started out first as residential and then moved into uh, commercial. And so for us in the early days, we started at this, this, this actual audience here in the middle was the residential homeowner. And we focused on actually making sure that they provided a really great experience. They had a really great experience, everything from booking um, right to delivery and then follow up afterwards. And we learned pretty quickly that there, uh, one of the reasons we got really excited about delivering commercial cleaning was the recurring revenue that was part of that. So we expanded our reach uh, from residential into commercial, and that started with handling a couple office managers and office buildings and then into restaurants. And so if you're anything like we were, we found out the hard way 
that really focusing in this industry on multiple audiences, even though we were really great at marketing to them, was a bit of a setback for us. And so over time, what we did was we phased out the residential because their product that they would they would buy from us and the the actual service we would deliver was extremely different from the service that the individual who worked in an office or the individual that uh, would actually be running a restaurant would really care about or why they would buy. So eventually what we did was even though we had three key targets, we phased out our residential, we phased out our restaurant owner, and we really doubled and tripled down on that office manager. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation here is really talk a little bit about how you can use one reference point to expand your marketing to attract that individual. So I want to introduce Olivia. So Olivia is an office manager and what you're looking at here is a tool that's really powerful at getting to know what marketing activities you need to think about uh, specifically that are going to be impactful to Olivia. So Olivia is a fictitious character uh, that we've drawn out, sometimes otherwise, otherwise referred to as a persona. And we talk a little bit about um, a day in the life of Olivia. You know, what channels does she interact with? And I'll expand on that in a little bit. What does she, uh, what does she learn about uh, our company once she comes in contact? And how does she really make a decision, right? Like what, what's, how's she feeling when she comes into contact with us? How does she evaluate other companies? And what does that process look like, right? And so this persona um, included in this presentation is a link to download this template so you can get a, an idea for it. It's meant not to be your persona uh, for your customer, but simply a reference point for you to consider building your own. So your target audience might not be specifically office managers, but the idea here is to design something that that is really intimately connected to Olivia's day to day so that your marketing can really start taking on uh, a more relevant feel to to connecting with her directly. So the first exercise that I'd like you to do is uh, in your worksheet. Uh, what we've included in the first column is the the actual column to write down your top three target personas that your business has. So if you have less than three, that's okay. Uh, you just have less homework to do here. Um, so we want you to, to just take a minute and you can pause this video and actually just write down in your worksheet the actual top three target personas that your business has. Okay, so now that we've finished writing down the personas, the next thing uh, that we want to expand on is selecting the right channels. And so what I mean by a channel is the way in which your message is, a is actually delivered to your end user or your end customer. And so before we jump into this, this section or this, this phase of that, I want to take us on a little bit of a detour. And so the detour is really meant to talk about some recent research that's been done by Google uh, in the last few years uh, that is often referred to as the ZMOT, or the acronym stands for the Zero Moment of Truth. And so what this research was done to do is dive in and challenge the typical marketing model that most marketing companies and marketing professionals subscribe to. And that's one of, we put stimulus in front of an actual uh, intended customer or a target audience and that will drive them to their first moment of truth which is the point where they come in contact with your product and the second moment of truth is when they become a customer and they start experiencing your product uh, from a day-to-day -day perspective and so this is where you would typically have a referral or word-of-mouth sort of thing take place and so what the research found was in the last six to seven years a very distinct new step has appeared as part of this process. So as many of you most likely have already done, if you've ever gone through the process of buying a car in the last few years, most of you probably didn't walk right into the dealership, ask the dealer for what cars they had and tell, ask them to tell you about what the car is all about. Um, you did research online, you looked up reviews, you talked to friends, you did this very distinct step prior to going into the dealership. You knew a lot more about 
the actual uh, the car before you actually jumped into the buying process. And that that's an example from a, a big purchase. But from a small purchase, something as subtle as maybe picking a place to go for lunch that day. Um, very common and something that happens all the time. You pull out your phone, you do a quick search, and you may use a, um, an actual service like Yelp or just do a quick Google search and look around. And more and more of us are becoming extremely comfortable doing this step. And so this is most times commonplace. So the reason it's so important in uh, the janitorial industry specifically or the business to business industry is that 71% of people actually do this before making the decision. And so that's really important because if you're not aware of that experience prior to them reaching out to you, you can overlook a lot of the opportunities that you have at your disposal. So there's a, there, in some respects, this number should scare you, but for in from the perspective that I'd like to look at it, it should excite you because there are very few companies, especially in the cleaning industry, that are taking advantage of this fact. So let's dive into a couple channels that you have access to use, um, like every other marketer in the industry, but I feel are often misused and underused. So we're gonna to touch a little bit on those. So most are probably familiar with Facebook and Google for obvious reasons. And these are two kind of core channels that most are gonna uh, are, are going to be familiar with. So I wanna spend a little bit of time about why each one's different and some of the ideas where you can, you can spend some time to understand how you can use them to your advantage. So what you're looking at here is a, a made up ad um, that I took a couple minutes to do in Facebook and actually built uh, based on what I typically see in the industry, which is a generic photo of something to do with cleaning uh, with some pretty common um, language used around what service we might. So if swept were actually a cleaning company, uh, which we are not, uh, but if we were, it might look something a little bit like this. So contact SWEPT to book a free quote, um, and SWEPT is in the janitorial services industry here, and when you hire us, uh, the company will, your company will benefit from, you know, uh, quality, performance, and accountability. And it's something that we hear often from most cleaning companies that advertise online. So most of you have probably seen an ad not necessarily for a janitorial company, but other some other ad that you've seen when you're scrolling through Facebook. And for search, if you're looking at Google, your ad might look something like this, right? If we operated in Tampa, um, our ad might look like janitorial services in Tampa, swept offers friendly staff, green, pro green products, and great prices. And so the key distinction here is that when we look at and compare the two, uh, the visual ads, you know, aside from the fact that they look different, uh, that Facebook ads look different and janitorial or the search ads look like text, the key thing is to think about what phase of a decision someone was in. So if you think about it for a second, when someone is actively doing a search for janitorial ser uh, services, they are much more likely looking or ready to buy. So often, this is why search is so performant for most companies that use it is when configured correctly and used well, um, you're gonna capture a lot of the interest out there because search is used to answer those questions. In this case, the question might be, who are the janitorial companies I should look into if I live in Tampa? But on the left-hand side here, uh, we're looking at the Facebook ad, and that Facebook ad is really something that would, would come into your newsfeed at a point where you might be at home, relaxing at the end of the day, or maybe you're at work, taking a break, and depending on how that ad was targeted at you, which Facebook has a number of different ways to do, you're not necessarily in the market for cleaning services. And so what a lot of people do is think about, okay, well, if I, if I have a business, I wanna think about advertising that business, and they think less about the channel and what decision, uh, what step of the decision-making process their customer might be in, and more about the fact that they can buy an ad. And so this is really just give you give everyone a, a little bit re reason to pause and think critically about how you would hold both of these ads accountable to delivering the same result. Uh, on the right, you're gonna most likely be much, much better off 
uh, capturing someone's attention who's actively looking for your service versus someone that might be just casually browsing. So the next exercise in the column directly beside your three personas that you wrote down, uh, I'd like you to just take one minute to kind of think about what channels your customers use. And again, don't worry about knowing for sure. Um, the whole purpose of these worksheets is really to just give you a quick once over of where, where it is that you think your initial thoughts are where they are. And if you don't have any answers, that's okay too. This is, the worksheet is really meant to have you walk away with a bit of that action plan where you know you need to think a little bit more about. So just take a moment, you can pause the video again, and, and, take, and write down those three channels that you think each of your customers might spend time in front of. So now that we've talked about our target audience and we've thought a little bit about where they might live, and where your message might reach them. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about communicating the right message. So communicating the right message is probably one of the biggest missteps that I see uh, whenever someone's you know selected the channels that they want to put out and they start putting their ad out. And, and on the reason that there's there's a bit of a, a pothole to avoid here is is that the reality of advertising today and marketing today is that the common consumer is going to be exposed to you know north of 5,000 different ad impressions a day and some studies say that's above 10,000 and so conservatively um, most of us are going to kind of you know on our drive to work or or somewhere about the day where you're, you're running chores you're going to run into a number of these ad impressions it may be a billboard it may be an ad on the side of a car it may be when you are taking that break at work and you're actually skimming through Facebook you see these ads you're on the websites that see that you see them and you're you know you're talking to in individuals that that are talking about products and these these impressions are being made constantly all the time every day and so for for uh, a business to just simply make their message that we're a cleaning company and we exist is really probably the biggest misuse of their resources and the biggest misstep that I, I found when I was working with other clients prior to focusing on the janitorial industry that, that I saw most of my clients do, which is they have an idea for a message and they just place it everywhere. And so really what I want to spend a little bit of time on is challenging that concept. So on the left, as you've seen here, this was the generic message. But on the right, if we go back to Olivia, one of the things that we found out for sure was that Olivia was really sick and tired of having to hire one cleaning company after another. For us, when we were cleaning ourselves, a number of the opportunities that we got to clean offices were due mainly to the fact that she was unhappy with the previous service. And so this ad on the right was one ad that we tested for our company. It was designed to really elicit that emotional response response and really get her to pay attention to why we might be someone that thinks a little bit differently. And so the ad instead of something like contact sweat for a free quote would be, are you frustrated with your cleaning company? And again, as most of the things in this, in this talk that these are not meant to be a uh, recommendation for what your ad should look like. It's just served solely as a, as a reference point for you to consider, you, you know, challenging your current way of thinking about what advertising should do for you and how thinking a little bit deeper and really honing in on your audience um, should play a part in, in crafting that right message. And so within Facebook, there's lots of different messages you can use. That was an example of a single image. Um, but for those of you that have invested in video, uh, Facebook offers you that very, very ability to do that. You can put an ad into Facebook that plays a video with and without audio. And um, it's just one of many different types of ads that you can use to capture that attention. So get creative with it. And so if we look at the other channel, Google, we're looking at search on the left, that typical ad that I, uh, we run into all the time. And then on the right, if I was being a little bit more specific with what I'm trying to communicate to Olivia, I may say, say something like the last cleaning company you're ever going to need to hire. And this is something that's going to resonate with her um, simply because she's frustrated, right? So will this work on every 
person out there? No, probably not. But the whole purpose is to combat that very real concept that we are just overloaded with messages all day long. And to, to actually have a chance at standing out, we have to be relevant. So within Google's ads, uh, this is obviously just an example of some extended capability that Google offers. There are things like reviews or what uh, in the green box there I'm highlighting are what re are referred to as site links. And site links are a way of expanding the physical size of your ad, but also giving your target audience uh, an option to ki kind of dive directly into the content that's relevant for you. So it costs no extra money to actually have your ad include these site links but you do have to think critically about what content you want to link them to. So for us, we use examples like, you know, our guarantee or how, our, how we hired our cleaners or specifically about the niches of, of, um, cleaning, of actual customers we focused on uh, depending on what they were searching for. And this worked extremely well. The, the good news is though, that all you really need to do is think about the content and Google offers you the ability to, in sometimes, double or triple the size of your ad, which will absolutely get you more, more traffic to your website and get more qualified traffic at the same time. So the exercise for this one is what I want you to do is pause the video again and take a second to write down three potential messages for each one of the channels that your persona would use. And remember, specifically, you want to think about what part of the decision-making process are they in when they come in contact with your, adver your advertisement and your message. So just take a minute, pause the video now, and, and we'll jump into the next one. So now we're going to focus on uh, the during phase. Right? So if we think about after having targeted our audience, selected the channel we think they're going to be in, and crafting a message that we think is going to be relevant to them, the next thing we want to do is actually capture a lead. So this phase is really all about making sure that your systems are set up to capture the lead uh, for your company. And so a lead is defined by a contact that has connected with your company in some way, shape, or form. So we're going to talk a little bit about how the different ways that we can do that. So the first step in this during phase is to make sure that you've planned the perfect content for them to see. Because your ad's job is to get their attention, this phase is really about making sure they're going to spend more time with you and dive deeper. So before we move on from there, I want to play a short five minute video that's going to get us in the right headspace for why uh, your message needs to be relevant to them uh, and get us on the right track for that. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. 
And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You ready to buy a computer from me? All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? So hopefully most of you resonated with that video. And, and uh, what I wanted to do is walk you through how we use this, this golden circle concept as something for our cleaning company that we, we use to actually craft this message. So our why was that we happy cleaners make happy customers and we focus on our cleaners so that they can focus on you and this was something that we crafted into a lot of our marketing material but also something that our sales team would communicate actively and our how was that we leverage technology to engage support and recognize our cleaners for the amazing the amazing work that they do cleaning your business this was different than most and i'm going to expand on that a little bit later but the what is basically what they experience. So the focus, this focus allows us to deliver unparalleled level of quality that you will experience on a daily basis. And so again, this is a reference point. This isn't to say you should take this and run with this as your why. Every company, every business, and every owner is gonna have a different perspective. The whole purpose of this is to really give you reason for pause and, and think critically about why you exist. What are the things that your company stands for and why should anyone care about it? So the exercise here, I wanna use this concept to think a little bit about once you've gotten them to your website and you've crafted that perfect content, let's take a second to do a sanity check on whether or not your content is doing the job you hope it does. So in this exercise, I want you to write down the top three questions you think each of those personas have once you get them to your website. 
And then the next step is to really, again, look critically at what content's there and understand what questions you might not be answering. So the obvious questions are fine, like, you know, how much do you cost or can I reach out for a quote, those sorts of things. But it's more about getting, you know, if we go back to where Olivia stood and we think about her day to day, what are the types of things that she's going to need to know and does your website actually answer those questions? So take a minute, pause the video once again, and uh, write down both of those sets, the questions you answer and the ones you don't. So our next step is really talking about how we take all of this planning and strategy that we've talked about and make sure that it's set up to actually capture technically and very literally the leads that you're actually bringing into your uh, from your website. So creating and setting up your systems. So a good way to, to look at this is a little bit like a funnel, right? Marketing's perspective or marketing's job um, when they are making a decision, when we're trying to get their attention, it's to let them know we exist, right? And so we talked about how you can use um, use a, a very relevant message to make your ad stand out and get that first impression or get the opportunity to deliver that first impression. So the marketing getting their attention is really to generate awareness about your business. And then the next one would be once you actually get their attention and you have it, um, how do you actually make that first impression that gives them uh, that gut check of I'm in the right place and I'm going to continue spending time on this and gain their interest. And then further after that, does your content on your website actually help them make the decision they need to make? Does it answer their questions? And then finally, if it does, does it provide a very clear action for them to take? And this is often about capturing the lead. So I'll give you a good, different couple examples. Once we've got them to the website, um, one of the things that's going to make them you know, spend time on your site or not is that first impression. And so on the left here, this is an example of obviously a cleaning company uh, that, that focuses on carpets, right? So it's both said there in the top as well as the visuals. They're focused on carpets. Um, whereas if we compare this to a typical website, it may so look something like this. And this site was not selected with any real um, thought given other than just simply doing a Google search in a specific city and you will find dozens and dozens of companies that look very similar to this. It's not to point out that this website is terrible in any way, it's just to contrast the specific nature of that first impression, right? So on the left, you're making a clear impact about whether or not you, you know, are a reputable company, and on the right, you may really be scared uh, away from pursuing this further. And the research shows that you have roughly eight seconds which is funny enough less than the attention of a goldfish you actually have eight seconds to get their attention make that first impression and get and gain the permission for them to explore further so the left is a good example of one that might do that another example in this case is a company that obviously focuses on cleaning windows right the imagery is there uh, whereas on the right you may have you know, a reputable company that's been around for a while but hasn't thought about how people go and do this research ahead of time. And so they haven't invested in their website uh, or they've just taken the time on their own to do it without bringing anyone in that's, that's focused specifically on doing this well. And so what ends up happening is that first impression is a negative one. And so the interesting thing is the two websites on the left are actually templates that any company can buy for under $100. The, the aesthetic part is not really the challenge because there's lots of different places out there that you can use um, to purchase those templates. The more important and the more time consuming and the more challenging aspect is to think about the content that is on the page. Um, what are your core values as this section on the left here outlines and why should anyone care about them? So I want to give an example of uh, someone that I do feel in the industry is doing it well. Some of you may be aware of a company called Handy. They focus specifically on uh, residential. That's their space. And on the left-hand side, you can see their, um, the image that they have is clearly marketed towards individuals at home, most likely female, 
and they're asking one of two questions. Do you need home cleaning or do you need a handyman? And so that's very clear. Which home service are you looking for? And so if you picked into one, you're going to get a little bit more information to dive deeper. But it's pretty clear right away that first impression is that this is an aesthetically pleasing site. It actually makes things very simple. And then if you have further questions, which some of which will maybe something like, well, I'm going to let these people into my home. Can I trust them? Or can I get someone when I need it? Or what happens if something goes wrong? So they're trusted professionals, the next day availability, and the happiness guarantee are all content that is right there front and center for them to help make that decision and dive a little deeper. So on the right hand side is just the, the screen as you would scroll down. If I've addressed those questions, the next question might be something like, well, how does this work? How do I actually get set up? And in this case, it's you pick a date and time, you put your credit card in, and you're good to go. And in this, this website, they can book uh, a time and place for someone to come to your house and clean it, you know, in under a minute and a half. And so it's a good example of like just taking these principles and turning them into a website that's always on and always working for you to communicate the right things. From a commercial standpoint, we may look at something like this. Again, this is not to say that Office Pride is exactly the type of site you should have at all. But what it does is clearly communicate that Office Pride here in Tampa focuses on commercial cleaning services. They're not trying to be something to everyone. It's focused on commercial. And then diving into that, let's say I owned a daycare. I'd be looking for not just that someone does commercial cleaning services, but that they have experience focusing on the specific needs that I have. And if any of you watching have ever cleaned a daycare or had a, a daycare as a, as a customer as we did, you know that that product and the delivery of that product is far more impactful than someone who, let's say, runs or manages an office. And the reason is that their business and how their customers feel about clean or about a clean space impacts their ability to bring in new customers and keep customers. If a parent or one of their customers was to have found an uncleanly uh, environment, how much of an impact do you think it would make on their, their ability to refer or you know, be happy about having their children dropped off? And so this is, this is about going one step deeper than just simply making sure they're in the right place. It's providing them the confidence to move forward that they get the nuance of the specific needs that you have. So two good examples. So as part of creating your system, you need to think about all the different ways that someone can reach out to you. So for those of you that are watching, hopefully you've, you've got um, some way on your website for you to fill out a form. For those of you that don't, I'm going to expand on why that's important. You, most of you probably, for those of you that do have a website, have your phone number on there. But um, there's a little bit more to go into and in making sure that you actually understand what marketing tactics are driving that phone to ring. So I'm going to touch on that. And then third is what I feel is an underutilized way of reaching out and generate a lead that is both an opportunity um, to, to engage a new audience or this, this more modern audience, but also an opportunity for you to kind of reconsider how, someone, how your website plays a role in them making the decision. So for, the, for these specific ways that they can reach out, I want to touch on three different tools that I think are really important for you to consider or do some further research on. The first is Google Analytics, and this is really about the specific traffic that's coming to your site and whether or not you have this set up so that you can monitor how many people and where they come from. I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. Secondly is a product called Ring Ninja that I was a part of the team that built. And this is a free product that allows you to actually replace the phone number on any marketing material that you have um, and actually track whether or not that phone call originated specifically from your website or maybe the side of your truck or uh, even on a pizza box, uh, depending on where you might want to advertise. And then third is a program called Intercom which is something you should consider, mainly uh, because it has a lot of great, uh, great user experience around actually making sure you're aware that someone's both on your website and you can cater to them well. So I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about each one of these. So from Google Analytics perspective, 
once it's set up, um, which is very easy to do, as part of this hand or as part of this session, we've included a resource sheet uh, that will actually give you uh, references to either how to set this up yourself or hire someone very inexpensively to set it up for you. Um, and once set up, um, Google Analytics is going to tell you out of the box um, a little bit about where your traffic's coming from. So this this report was set up looking at um, the actual bookings that happened in a given time frame. And of those bookings that happened, where did those bookings take place? Was it Google? Was it Facebook? Was it paid search? Was it the actual Google AdWords we were using? Or was it something like referred from content or referred from email? And so this is really important because if you don't know where your leads and your bookings are coming from, um, then it's extremely hard to understand where to put your marketing emphasis. It's extremely hard to know whether or not that consultant you hired for a thousand dollars a month is actually earning um, the return that you were expecting. And so when you're actually going to invest into marketing, this is a fundamental piece that you need to make sure is in place. And this report comes out of the box. So uh, as I said, the reference there is there for you guys to kind of dive into this. Uh, I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time in each one of these. It's mainly to let you know that it exists and that you need to do further research on it. The next is when you actually want to track your phone call leads. And so Ring Ninja, as I mentioned, was a tool that I was a part of the team that built. Um, this is meant mainly to just help you understand when a call does come in to you or someone on your sales team, that where did it come from? And so you'd simply just type in the source and the source being, you know, the side of your, your truck or uh, the website or your Facebook ad that you put out. And then where do you want it to forward to? And that's as simple as taking in the phone number that currently rings. So you don't have to buy any large infrastructure. You just simply have to forward these services. So check out ring.ninja. This is going to give you a, a firm understanding of how often um, that marketing material is actually making the phone ring. And at a minimum, it's just going to give you that confidence that your website is actually something that people use before they call. All you have to do is swap out the phone number on the website with the current one, replace it with the one that Ring Ninja will help you set up, and then you're good to go. And you'll start getting emails and recordings of these calls so that you, you'll be more comfortable with um, what role your website plays. And the last is uh, Intercom. So there are many companies or many of these chat programs out there. Intercom is just one. Uh, it's one that we've been very successful with and we've used and some of you if you've ever been on our we our, our website sweatworks.com um, you may have seen this little pop-up pop happen. So it's not there isn't always someone sitting right next to a computer ready to ready to go. Um, Intercom and others like it will actually let you pop up a message and try and interact with um, with a customer. Right, a potential person who's on your website, and may it, it may be something very simple like, you know, thanks for thanks for checking out our website. How can we help? And nothing more complicated than that. And you'll be very surprised how often that that simple question will lead to them simply asking a follow up. And what you really want to try and do is capitalize on this urgency, right? Because one of the things that we're going to touch on is how important it is to be responsive to these leads as they come in. So for this exercise, what I'd like you to do is a little bit of a, a check on your current systems, right? How well are you set up to actually understand where your leads are coming from? So do you have Google Analytics installed? And are you tracking calls? Someone in your organization might be, but if you're not sure, you need to ask. And if you're the one that's running the show, um, you need to start understanding where they're coming from. And if you are going to consider chat, which I highly encourage you to do so, how will you support it? Who will it be? Um, and do you know where the leads come from currently? And if you do, make sure that that report is shared with the rest of your team, right? Whether, whether or not you're a team of just one or two people or a team of dozens who manage your cleaning company, understanding where your leads come, come from will give everyone a better understanding of why marketing's role within the organization is so important to driving the growth of your business. So the next step is really about integrating with sales. So let's talk a little bit about that one. So generating a lead is no insignificant achievement. 
It's not an easy thing to do. So congratulations, you've done that part. Actually getting a lead is, in most cases, where people feel marketing's role stops. And um, part of what I want to do today is hopefully challenge you on that concept. I couldn't disagree more, and it's one of the reasons that I think marketing uh, professionals kind of, their value is under, under misunderstood is that the think it once the lead comes in it's sales job to take over so i'm going to challenge that a little bit the first challenge is that once a lead comes in 73 percent of the people that will buy from the person that responds is the person that was first to respond and this is even more specific from b2b and within the janitorial industry i would argue subjectively that this is even higher uh, in our own experience, we saw leads that we followed up with in less than five minutes move on to another company and make a decision to hire them over us simply because they were the first person to answer the phone. So the challenge here is to not not you know get all bent into shape about the fact that this is our reality, but more leverage it to our advantage because very few companies. Uh, even fewer companies within this industry are going to be prepared for this reality. So you can be the very some of the very few that are. So from a phone call perspective, how many that are watching right now have someone to answer the phone 100% of the time? And of those people, if you are the individual that are answering the phone, you don't have a system that can scale and help you grow. Because as soon as that phone goes to voicemail, you lose the opportunity to take advantage of that stat. And so what I want to suggest is that you invest in, or at least research, how you can have a call answering service, take that phone, answer the, phone, the, the primary questions, and fire that over to someone who's going to follow up as soon as possible. Second is to make sure that any leads that are filled out on the website are treated with as much urgency as a phone call. So many times we work with companies um, that, that are customers of Swept or companies in my previous life where I was working with a consult, uh, as a consultant in the marketing world where a lead on the website was, was got to as soon as someone could. And that is just a missed opportunity and the stats support that. So you have to treat a lead from a website even though they filled out a form as opposed to picking up the phone as no less urgent than someone that is calling. Third is to make sure that you are experimenting with chat as a form of generating these leads. Because most of you that are watching have probably experienced being on the other end. You've seen a chat bubble pop up, you've asked a question. Um, and for those of you that haven't, it's going to become more and more common. This is a way that um, sales and customer service are becoming more proactive at answering questions to take advantage of generating that interest early and often to capture that interest. So the exercise here is to do a little bit about, uh, is to think critically and communicate within your team. What is your goal to respond to a lead? Write it down and make sure that everyone in your organization understands what that goal is. Secondly, think about the changes, either from a process or responsibility perspective, that you need to change to meet that goal. So as I had mentioned, for us it was within five minutes. When it didn't, we didn't have someone respond with that in that five minutes, and we lost those customers, and that happened more than once. We started really valuing whether or not we needed to invest in a virtual service that would answer that phone and handle some basic questions. So Ring Ninja can help you understand that. You can even record the calls uh, so that you can better understand whether or not the person answering the phone is interacting with your potential uh, customer, your prospect, in the way you want them to. And then third is probably most important. Who is responsible for meeting that goal? If you have set a goal and no one's measuring it and no one's held accountable to it, you might as well not have the goal. So make sure there is someone made responsible for measuring and reporting back to the team. So the, the last section is really where we've generated the lead, they've done the walkthrough, you've successfully won the contract. 
and now we're actually into the the customer experience phase so this is after they become a customer and so the first thing that I want to talk a little bit about is you know what's this channel's objective turning your customer into an advocate is the goal of the after phase so for those of you that are listening um, or watching you you may you most likely would agree that some of the best business leads that are generated are ones through referral so the whole purpose of marketing's role in the after phase is to is to be very intentional about how you can communicate proactively to make sure people are promoting your business and willingly doing that becoming advocates so let's start by talking about what it means to deliver world-class customer service so swept did uh, a research study uh, last year um, where we asked this one question of 500 business owners in uh, in the United States and we asked this one question budget aside when hiring a new cleaning company would their use of technology to improve quality and communication impact your decision to hire them and so not so surprising to some but maybe surprising to others is that 96 percent said yes and so this is objective data that we feel actually communicates the shift that we benefited from so drastically which was the bar within the industry is low enough that any use of technology any use of this you know uh, any proof that shows that your company is forward-thinking in adopting innovative approaches to better communicate and address the concerns that they might have is going to help them make a decision to hire you so this is essentially how they experience your customer service this is the key thing about making sure that from a marketing perspective you don't think that once the contract is won and the customer is now receiving your service that marketing's job is done you have to think about how the individuals that are handling the customer experience can be supported from a marketing perspective so I'm going to throw out one idea that was really impactful for us that hopefully most of you can benefit from so that's one of quality inspections so for us quality inspections were the single most important touch point that our customers had with us um, and we learned this the hard way and so going back years when we were still running the company uh, I remember getting a call from uh, you know a really great customer this is a customer that had been with us not for a long time for just over half a year great customer we had a great relationship with them and they gave me a call and said hey Matt I just uh, I got a call from one of your competitors competitor XYZ okay great and you know we, look we're not looking to shift um, we're not looking to change we're happy with your guys service but they said something that I really you know I really wanted to find out whether or not you guys could do for us and that was that they had been you know they promised to do uh, a quality inspection every 30 days and so the insight for me was not so much that you know my customer wanted quality inspections done right they wanted to know that we were on site doing over overseeing our cleaners uh, work but more importantly was the fact that we had been doing quality inspections from day one for that customer and they were simply unaware of it and that was really a failure on our part that was our marketing misstep that was us not doing the job to make sure that the, the right communication was getting to our customer and making that impact make make a positive customer experience right so for for those of you that are doing quality inspections it's not enough to just simply do them it's you really need to focus on making sure that your customers experience that quality inspection and that your presence there is known so the exercise for this for those of you that aren't doing it and hadn't yet haven't yet learned that that lesson um, think constructively about three different ways you can bring your customer into the quality process so for us it was really important to do and we not only retained that customer and got excited about uh, about showing them how often we were in to do to clean that space we used it as an opportunity to you know kind of double down with our existing customers and communicate to them that they were the most important person in our quality system and if they didn't have communication openly and freely with us that they were not going to experience the level of quality that we were already delivering 
So this is really important. You want to think about three different ways how you're going to bring your customer into that quality process. So the second is to think about once you're delivering great service and they feel you're delivering that world-class customer service, how do you increase the lifetime value of that customer? So what is lifetime value? So the definition is the prediction of net profit attributed to the entire future relationship with that customer. So if you think of, you know, some of you may already know this number, which is fantastic. Um, the majority of people have a rough guess, but they don't quantify it very intentionally. And so this should be, you know, look at all of the, the lifetime value, the average number of months a customer is with you. And all over across all of your customers, take the total number of months and divide it by your total number of customers. And that is your lifetime, the total lifetime value of it, depending on the value of that contract. And so what you want to do is use that as a reference point to increase that over time and set a goal towards that. But you have to be intentional about it. It's not enough to just set that goal. You have to actually be intentional about it. So I'm going to share a couple ways that we were really successful at increasing the level of service and the, the amount of revenue that we brought in from a customer and thinking again from marketing's perspective. This is not just a sales job. This is marketing's job to think about. So if we go back to Olivia, as I mentioned, she was our persona. She works uh, as the office manager for a marketing company. And we think about what her business objectives are. She needs to impress clients that visit the office. So in a marketing agency, having someone come through often is, is part of the allure of working with you know, a successful agency. You have really nice a physical office and, and going there to actually brainstorm and be a productive part of that creative process is really important to customers. So making sure that that impresses was part of her, jo her job. Also, she has to maintain the profitability margins for billable workers. So in marketing, it's a professional services company. So Olivia's job is making sure that those people are maintaining billable hours for their work. So if we look at those objectives and drill a little bit more into the problems, we can think about the things she might run into that are aligned with those objectives. So in the east coast of Canada or anywhere in the US, anywhere that has winter, you're going to run into issues with salt, most likely. So salt, at least where we're from, is used to melt the ice at any given, any given uh, time of the year uh, when ice is an issue, and that causes a lot of salt stains. And then also, during the winter, you're going to run into sick employees, right? And that costs a lot of money because there's flu season. So with these objectives in mind that, you know, we align with her problems and kind of brainstormed on those, how can the services we offer really improve our relationship with her and at the same time increase the amount of revenue we, we can generate from her? So for us, as an example, we didn't want to get into any type of seasonal mat replacement. So we partnered with another company who would come in and actually replace the mats for her ongoing. And for us, it was a great form of referral, right? So we refer them to, to our customers. They would have customer. We would share the same customer and it was mutually beneficial. Same thing with UV scrubbing. For those of you that don't uh, don't know anything about this part, it's really under purchasing a UV wand that could be used for scrubbing a workstation and reducing the amount of infectious, uh, you know, uh, diseases that go on during flu season, so influenza and, and and things like that. So going to Olivia and letting her know that you know we're thinking ahead for her. We know that Matt or that um, you know her job is to make sure the space looks good, and we know that her job is to really make sure that the the her employees are healthy. We pitched these two ideas to her, and she was eager to take us up on both. And so, in addition to actually increasing our revenue, we also strengthened our relationship. These were things she did not need to think about. We were thinking uh, about on her behalf. And so it was really important to, to make sure that we're constantly doing those things for her and for other customers in the same. So be proactive about it. Don't just sit there and wait for her to contact you and think that marketing's job is to just 
simply take the lead and hand it over to sales and the sales job. You, you need to be proactive about how you are going to communicate to your customer and how you're going to solve their problems. It's not about you. It's about your alignment of their problems with your services. So remove what you have to sell and think first about their objectives, their problems, and what you have that aligns. So the exercise is to think about what problems, other than cleaning, you can help them with. Right? Write down three problems your customers have that align with your services, and then what actions do you need to take to solve them. And so that may be you know, creating a quick brochure that you send out either through email or through you know, printing them off and handing them out the next time you're on site or your QA manager's on site to let them know that you're thinking about them. Right? It's not, it doesn't need to be complicated for it to be effective. And so the last session, or the last se section here in the after is about stimulating referrals. So again, remember the objective of this phase is really about creating advocates. So the best type of lead you can get is a referral. And so there are six different steps that we think are really important and were really impactful for us when we were developing our referral engine that was very much part of marketing's role to make sure it was well thought out and executed. And the first thing is to ask. It, it may go without saying that you know asking referral for referrals is the obvious way to get referrals, but so often not everyone knows that this is something that needs to be done intentionally. And so making a process or making a step within your sales uh, within your sales process that is to ask for the referral whether or not it's at the point where they've signed on for a contract or you know a scheduled check-in after you've done a deep clean or three months into a you know three months into contract with them where you're going to reach out and do it so for us we prep them as we were as we were closing the contract to say look within a few months we're going to reach back out to you we'd really love to get your testimonial of the service if we've delivered on what we said we were going to do and we'd love to you know not only have your your testimony but we work through referral quite extensively and we depend on that as part of the way that we do business we'd only ask you to do it if you're happy with the service simply saying that ahead of time they were prepared they were prepared for us to ask and they were prepared for, for to uh, to actually do do it for us Second is to make it simple. Don't make them jump through any hoops. Uh, make filling that out, whether or not it's a form on your website uh, or a form in an email that you just simply give them a link, don't make them jump through hoops, right? So make it very clear what information you need from them. Third is to test incentives. So for th some of you that already have referral programs, uh, I want you to benefit from one of the missteps we made, which was to actually roll out an incentive program that for some was great. You know, we, we, we said that part of our referral program as referrals come in, we're gonna send you out um, you know, a gift certificate for a steak dinner. This was for some over the moon. They were super excited about it. But for others, um, we, we nearly lost the contract. And it was only a couple, but it was a very important lesson for us to learn that what had happened was that the relationship that the sales individual and our our team had formed with them was so intimate was so much you know uh, you know close to a friendship that the fact that we simply tried to send them an incentive um, from a marketing perspective insulted and jeopardized that relationship so luckily we were able to salvage it but you can't just assume that every individual is going to be motivated by the same thing so this part of the way we mitigated against this was simply to make talking about our incentives part of how we did rolled it out when we were talking about our referral program. So no feelings were hurt. They knew to expect it and they knew to, um, you know, that the compensation was something we wanted to do uh, for their effort. Fourth is to collect the right info. So in that form that you're actually uh, going to make very easy for them or that process that's going to be very easy for them to understand, make sure you tell them what info you need to do the right job in following up with that referral. Don't, don't allow that, that referral to fall through the cracks simply because you didn't know what was expected. How soon are they expecting to hear from you? Is it okay to follow up in a week? The answer to that question is no, but you want to make sure that expectation is clear 
and you want to make sure you have all the info. So when it gets handed off to the individual that's going to do it, you have all the info you need to get going on it. Fifth is don't just think about your customers. Think about referrals from all different uh, types of companies that you may want to interact with that share the same customer as you. So as an example, when we were doing residential, one successful referral channel for us was real estate agents. And so real estate agents, um, as part of delivering their service, their homeowners, as they're selling a house, have a very stressful time. If anyone that's listening has ever, um, ever sold a home, you know that that closing day is really stressful. There's a lot to do, and there's a lot riding on making sure that everything goes smoothly. So what we did was put a package together for our real estate agent referral network that allowed them to offer our services as a closing gift. And that closing gift was something that not only was unexpected, but directly aligned with reducing the stress for that person that was selling the home. And so that was a great win-win-win situation. We got a potential new long-term customer because they experienced the cleaning service uh, from a residential side and the real estate agent strengthened their relationship as well. So look for opportunities that are not so obvious about how anyone that shares your customer can mutually benefit from both, both you and them working together. And then last is to put this into action you need to start with your best. So don't worry about trying to roll out a big program and put everything together uh, before you get started. Start early with just a few that you're going to know you already have great relationships with and that you're excited to go talk to them about. And, And in these first few, just start by asking them about a referral program. What would they want? Would they be comfortable with it? Is this the sort of thing that, you know, compensating them would be okay? Um, And so use that input as you're talking to them about how you would structure your referral program. Don't just go off and scroll away in your office, come up with it and roll it out without talking to your customers. These are the ones that are going to experience it. And your partners are the ones that are going to experience it. So talk to them and start with just the first few that you have great relationships with. So the last exercise here is to write down the three companies that you're ready to approach. Create a form that you're actually going to use when you're going to send them and ask for that referral. And then most importantly, schedule three meetings in your calendar where you're going to actually reach out to those three companies and ask. Ask for them. You put it in your calendar, it is way more likely that it's going to get done. So don't be shy about going out. Put it in your calendar for a morning or an afternoon, depending on how it works for your day, and make sure you put this into action. So those are all the components from A to Z before your customer is is actually a customer during the point where they're actually, you've gotten their attention and then after they've become that customer and all those moving parts in between that hopefully will give you a better idea uh, as to where you need to start and the those worksheets that you filled out along the way um, are going to help you put together and execute on this from a, the standpoint of an action plan. The whole purpose is to review those sheets, get an understanding of what you need to get done, and then most importantly, get started. So for those of you that don't know who your target audience is or have an idea, go back to the basis here. Think, start at the top in before, work your way down and across. And once all of them are filled in, that may take some time, but you'll know you have an engine that's firing on all cylinders and that everyone understands the value of marketing's role within your organization. Thank you everyone for watching. Hopefully you've taken a lot of value out of this. We'd love your feedback on it. Uh, You can reach out to us directly and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks very much.